Hello and welcome to the full story series right here at Comic Storian, where we grab multiple complete stories that we have done over the past couple of months and we put them together to make one full story. Hence the name. Today we're going to be doing the Avatar The Last Airbender series, The Search. The Search is the second in the Avatar The Last Airbender comic series and goes into the search for Zuko's mother. So let's get on in. It was decades in the past, the town of Hira. Ikim stands on the stage practicing his lines for the upcoming play about the Dragon Emperor. He is startled as Ursa jumps around the corner, surprising him and forcing him to stumble to the ground. She laughs as he yells at her for scaring him, calling him her cowardly boyfriend. She tells Ikum that she has gotten the role of the Dragon Empress in the play. Ikum congratulates her, offering to practice their kiss together. They practice their lines, kissing together in their dragon masks. As Ursa pulls away, Ikum stares at her before finally asking her the question. Will you marry me? He asks. She stares at him, confused, checking her script for the line, but he pulls off his mask repeating the question, and she smiles up at him and accepts his proposal. They hold each other, kissing. In the present day, in the city of Yu Dao, Aang and his friends sit around the conference table with the other leaders and officials, listening to the teachings of an old man. Well, listening is a strong word, as all they hear is blah, blah, blah. Sokka leans over to Aang, asking how listening to a boring lecture is supposed to help them figure out what to do with Yu Dao. Aang agrees, telling Sokka that the Earth King believes that hearing about the Earth Kingdom's past will help them figure out the future. But he disagrees. We need a new way of seeing the Four Nations, Aang begins, but is interrupted by a furious Katara who shushes the both of them. Surprise, surprise, my boring sister likes the boring lecture guy, Sokka shrugs. Aang looks at him. Hey, that's my girlfriend you're talking about, he hisses. Zuko sits next to them, not paying any more attention to his friends than he is the teacher. But the word family snaps him back to the present, forcing him to raise his hand. Professor, can you repeat that last part, he asks. The teacher sighs, realizing that all teenagers are alike. He repeats himself, telling the room once again that the Earth Kingdom believes that family is in essence a small family, and the nation a large family. In treating his own family with dignity, a ruler learns to govern his nation with dignity, the teacher explains. Zuko sits for a moment as the professor returns to his lecture, and Aang leans over, asking if his friend is okay. I put my father in prison and my sister in an institution. My mother was banished for years. What does that mean for my nation? He asks the Avatar. Aang tries to comfort him and Sokka explains that only boring people would listen to the boring professor. Katara smacks him in the face with snow water bended from her cup. In the village of Hira, Ursa runs home, eager to tell her family about her marriage proposal. But she comes in to discover her mother is crying on the floor. What's wrong? Where's dad? She asks. Her mother wipes away a tear, telling her that her father is in the back with a visitor. Entering the greenhouse, Ursa's father tells her to show respect to their guest, the Fire Lord Azulon. Ursa bows before their ruler, but the Fire Lord tells her to rise. We've had such trouble finding Avatar Roku's descendants. It's as if he wanted to keep you hidden from us, the Fire Lord smiles. But he tells her that the search was worth it, that the pairing of the Avatar's granddaughter with his son will yield a bloodline of great power, one that will help ensure my family's rule for centuries after I'm gone, he tells them. Gesturing over his shoulder, he introduces the other man in the room. Ursa, may I introduce you to Fire Prince Ozai my second son. He has a proposal for you, the Fire Lord says. In the present, Zuko is once again in the Fire Nation, flanked by his two guards Suki and Tai Li. He briefly tells them about the lectures in the Earth Kingdom before glancing into the prison rooms. 
Have they said anything to each other? He asks, glancing at his straight-jacketed sister and his imprisoned father. Not a word, Suki reports. Zuko orders them to open the door and enters with a tray of tea. The guards are shocked that he would do something like this. They are still my family, Zuko tells them. And he offers his sister the tray, but she lunges out with her teeth, biting the tray and throwing it to the floor, tripping Zuko. Inside his cell, Ozai smiles. How did you expect me to drink tea in a straitjacket, Zuzu? Did you want me to lap it up like some kind of animal? Azula shouts, standing over her brother. Tai Lee rushes in, attacking Azula with her chi blocking techniques. From the floor, Azula snarls at Tai Lee, rambling incoherently. Zuko orders his guards to leave. He picks his sister up, telling her that the tea was in the hope that it would give her and their father some dignity. Azula looks over her shoulder at her brother, telling him that if he wants to give them dignity, that they should be able to speak in private. Fine, Zuko agrees after pondering for a moment. He walks outside of the cell, telling the guards to give them half an hour. Tai Li disagrees with the idea, but Zuko is firm. Like it or not, Azula is my best chance of finding my mother, he tells her. In the past, the Fire Lord's carriage is being pulled out of the city, but they are stopped as Ikem shouts from the road, blocking their path. Fire Lord Azulon, you have my... my true love in your carriage. With all due respect, I can't let you take her from me. He shouts, his words stuttering. The guards begin to laugh, realizing that Ikem's swords are actually just stage props. Take care of him, Azulon orders. And the guards move in, but Ikem leaps among them, smacking them in the face with the wooden weapons. Ikem dodges as fire is launched at him, but he can't last for long. In the carriage, Ursa begs Ozai to call off the guards. I'll get him to leave, but you have to promise not to hurt him. Please, my love, she begs. Ozine leans out the door, ordering the soldiers to stand down. Stepping from the carriage, Ursa rushes forward, telling Ikem that he has to leave. The decision's been made. Nothing can change it, she tells him. Tell me that marrying the prince is what you truly want. Tell me and I'll go home, Ikem whispers to her. She looks back at the Fire Lord and the Fire Prince before turning back to Ikem, tears in her eyes. Fire Prince Ozai honored my family by asking for my hand in marriage, and I joyfully accepted. Now for your sake and mine, go home, she tells him. The carriage moves forward, leaving Ikem crying in the dust. Later, they begin to wheel Azula back to her quarters, but Zuko tells Suki and Tai Li to get some rest. Zuko, I'd feel better if we accompanied you the rest of the way, Suki tells him. But Zuko shakes his head, telling her that he can escort his sister on his own. Be careful! The chi blocking is going to wear off soon, Tai Li tells him. Pushing his sister forward, Zuko lets Azula know that he won't be returning her to the institution, that he has prepared her old room in the palace. Have you ever been chi blocked, Zuzu? Azula asks him. Funny thing, all your joints go soft like they're melted wax. Then for just a few moments, as your strength returns, you find yourself more flexible than you ever thought possible. She tells him, slipping her hand free as it crackles with lightning. She launches a blast at Zuko, forcing him backwards. Stop! He yells, launching a fireball at her as she begins to bounce away. But Azula flips, allowing the fire to burn through her straitjacket and free her. Now free, she launches herself through one of the palace walls and continues to flee. In the past, Ikem wanders away from Hira. Sadness fills him, and he begins to build a life for himself outside the village. He builds shelter, teaching himself to survive off the land. One night, he stares into his fire. Turning his head, he looks across the river, seeing a large wolf spirit drinking from the water. Zuko rushes inside, finding a wounded soldier who points him in the direction of his sister. Racing through the palace, Zuko finds Azula's old room, and he feels the heat coming off a Fire Nation banner and burns it, revealing a secret passage. 
Following the passage down, he finds Azula in a secret chamber, rummaging through an old trunk. They're here, just like Father said. He overcame her control long enough to give me the truth. She shouts. Zuko is shocked by the secret chamber, but he doesn't have time for that. He orders Azula to give him the letters that she is holding as she reveals that they were written by their mother. There are many years of letters that she wrote, and they're the key to finding her. Come, have a look. She taunts as she burns them in her hand, secretly hiding one of the letters behind her back. Zuko yells at his sister as she continues to taunt him, but she suddenly holds her head in her hands. Look, believe it or not, dear brother, I want to find her as much as you do. So I'll tell you what was in those letters under one condition, she tells him. Decades in the past, at the wedding of Ozai and Ursa, the young woman looks around at the celebration. Ozai leans in, telling her that she has lovely parents. Thank you. They've always been good to me, she tells him. He smiles at her, telling her that she should let them know that for her last words to them. So their memory of you will always be sweet. He smiles madly. She doesn't understand, and Ozai explains that as the princess of the Fire Nation, her old life no longer exists. After this day, do not mention Hira, your family, or your old life ever again. You belong to the royal family now, and to me. He whispers to her, leaning in and kissing her on the cheek. In the present day, Appa descends towards the Fire Nation palace, with Aang, Katara, and Sokka jumping off to greet Iroh as he comes out to them. Iroh yells for his nephew, letting him know that his friends are here. As Zuko comes out, Aang bows to the Fire Lord, telling him that it has been too long since they've seen each other. It's only been a week, Zuko points out. When the friends ask Zuko why he contacted them, he lets them know that he learned of the village his mother was born in. I'm going to look for her. Uncle Iroh's agreed to watch over things here while I'm gone, he tells them. May you find who and what you are searching for, nephew, Iroh tells Zuko, bowing solemnly. That's great, Zuko, but it sounds like you've got everything covered, Aang begins. Why do you need us? Katara finishes for her sweetie. Zuko nods, telling them that the information came at a cost. Aang and Katara are shocked as Azula reveals herself behind Zuko. The friends leap into action, prepare to defend themselves and Zuko. But Suki and Tai Lee come out, telling them to stand down. Azula was the one who got the information from Ozai. Because she helped me out, we made a deal. She's going to come with me to look for our mother, and she is going to travel unbound with dignity. And I want you all to come with us, Zuko tells his friends. No offense, but that sounds like the worst plan ever, Aang tells him. But Iroh finally steps forward. Ever since my nephew ascended the throne, he has yearned for peace. Finding Ursa may bring that peace, and not just for himself, Iroh tells Aang, glancing over at Azula. And the Avatar smiles, finally stepping up to Zuko. We're your friends, Zuko. If you need us, we'll go with you, he tells him. The next day, Aang lands Appa in the courtyard, greeting Azula. Hmm, better be careful when you put my luggage on that shaggy beast of yours. She snaps, throwing her bag on the ground. Appa growls at her, with Aang petting him. I know, buddy. It'll only be for a little while, he tells the Sky Bison as he calms him. Over to the side, Zuko comments to Katara that they'll have to keep watch on his sister, with Sokka offering to take the first. I appreciate the offer, Sokka, but maybe we should leave it to one of the benders, Zuko tells his friend. But Sokka is eager to prove himself, pulling out his boomerang and ordering Azula to board the Sky Bison. She shocks the metal in his hand quickly, but Katara is there, freezing her hand so she can't bend. Katara runs over, yelling at Azula to never touch her brother. Tell your brother to not wave his stupid toys in my face, she hisses. Zuko steps up to his sister, reminding her that they had a deal and that she has to remain calm. 
Keep your merry band of misfits in check, and we'll get along just fine, she smiles at him. I changed my mind. One of you guys take the first watch, Sokka tells them sheepishly. As the sky bison flies away, Iroh and the others wave goodbye. He looks around at the palace, surprised that he ever wanted to live in such a dreary place. He smiles, pulling the weapon from a soldier's hand and handing him a cup of tea instead. That's it, he shouts with a smile. I have discovered my first order of business as interim fire lord. I will declare a national tea appreciation day. As Appa flies through the open skies, the group discuss how this adventure is just like the old times. But Aang looks at their new companion. Well, instead of Toph, now we have... He begins, motioning towards Azula, who stares them all with madness in her eyes. So tell me, kids, I've been dying to know. Which of you miscreants did she approach first? She questions, insanity in her voice. Katara stands up, questioning what Azula is even talking about. None of you had even met me yet. How did she convince you to ruin my life? She demands, standing up to meet Katara. But Zuko is there, telling her to calm down, his hand sizzling from the heat. Put that away, Zuko. It's just small talk, she tells him, calmness once more in her voice. I miss Toph. Sokka sighs, leaning away from the madness. You said it, Aang agrees. Time passes, and Zuko looks out on the horizon, seeing Hira in the distance. He comments that he hopes they can get there before sunset, not wishing to enter the village in the night like bandits. Sokka agrees, turning to ask Aang his opinion, before noticing that the Avatar has an angry look on his face, glaring at the world. What? Is it not enough to have one crazy passenger with crazy eyes? Sokka demands, startled. The rest begin to question Aang, but he doesn't understand either. I can't help it. There's something out there, some kind of spirit. I can feel its presence, especially in my face, he tells them. Sokka begins to joke around, but Aang looks over the side, seeing a massive wolf running through the foothills. Did you guys see that giant wolf spirit? I think that's the presence I'm feeling, he tells them. But Zuko glances over the side, seeing nothing. But when he turns back, he sees his sister standing on the edge of Appa's saddle. Azula, get down from there, he shouts at her. She holds out her arms, looking over her shoulder at the others. I can't tell you what a pleasure it's been riding with you all, listening to you bicker. Too bad not all siblings get along as well as Zuzu and me. Now that Hira is a hop, skip, and a jump away, it's time to bid you farewell, she tells them, leaping off the side as Zuko yells after her. Aang leaps over as well, catching the air with his glider. He catches the princess, but she turns, burning a hole through the wing of his glider, and continues to plummet towards the earth. Azula lands, pausing only briefly before she starts to run away. Behind her, Aang crashes into the earth, his glider broken. Appa lands nearby, with Zuko leaping off one side while Katara and Sokka go for Aang. You guys go make sure Aang is okay, I'll go after Azula, he shouts to his friends. Azula doesn't slow, leaping over a stream, but a voice brings her up short, and she turns back, looking at the reflection in the water. You're only hurting yourself, my daughter, Ursa says from the shimmering water. Don't pretend you care about me, Azula hisses at the image of her mother. You thought you could break me, didn't you, by having Zuko lock me up in that institution? But I'm stronger than you realize. I used all my time alone to figure out the truth. You've been conspiring to take me down from the day I was born. Even when I was an infant, you saw something in me you never had. Power! That's why you think I'm a monster. My power makes you fear me. She screams at the river, but Ursa tries to tell her daughter that she is confused. But Azula turns away. She still hasn't figured everything out, but she will. I can't become Fire Lord with you constantly conspiring to undo me. That's why I'm going to find you, mother, and end you, she vows. Ursa tries to tell her daughter that she loves her, 
but Azula turns, hitting the water with a bolt of energy. Water rains down from the displaced stream, and Zuko finally catches up with his sister. Who are you talking to? He asks. She drops into a combat stance, but Zuko pleads with her to keep to the deal, that they will find their mother together. But Azula laughs, telling Zuko that she doesn't really need him, and he drops into a combat stance with fire burning in his hand. Please, I don't want to do this, he tells her. But suddenly, the stream water shifts and flows out of the river, hitting and freezing Azula. She falls to the ground, wrapped in ice. I really don't appreciate you trying to set my boyfriend on fire, Katara fumes as she stalks forward. Zuko begins to ask Aang if he's okay from his fall, but the Avatar has the crazy look on his face again. I feel the presence again, Aang hisses. Azula begins to rant at Katara, but her words suddenly stop as she gasps in shock. Behind Sokka stands the massive wolf spirit. Back in the past, Ursa finishes writing a letter, hiding it in the folds of her robe. She is interrupted by a young Zuko, though, who tells his mother that he is too scared to sleep as he rubs his eyes. She picks him up, carrying him back to his room as he tells her about the dream, that he was surrounded by fire and Azula was laughing at him. They pass his sister's room, with Ursa pointing out how she wouldn't hurt him. She leaves the boy in his bed, telling him to hold on tightly to the good dreams, telling him that it was just a nightmare and to hold on tightly to the good dreams. With this done, she moves through the palace, and she knocks on a servant's door, greeting the old woman as she answers. She hands her the letter, asking her once more to deliver it to Hira in confidence. Of course, just like all the others, the old woman nods. As the princess leaves, the old woman waits until she can't hear her in the hall anymore. Finally, she turns to put the letters with all the other undelivered ones, but first, she reads it. Shock pulls at her face as she stares at the words. She quickly finds Ozai training, bowing and asking for forgiveness from the Fire Prince. She holds up the letter, asking him to read it. I told you to file those away, he snaps, wiping the sweat from his body. Here. Ursa reveals a secret that requires my prince's immediate attention, she tells him. Ozai takes the letter and the woman quickly leaves the chamber. Scanning the words, anger begins to fill Ozai's eyes. Impossible! Back in the present, the spirit wolf is snapping at the heroes, with Aang asking everybody to be respectful of the creature. Respectful? It just tried to eat my head! Sokka yells. Zuko looks at the marking on the creature's chest, noting how they look like the face that Aang had been making. The Avatar leaps into the air, trying to plead with the Great Spirit. He offers the creature peace, motioning to the captured Azula. My friends and I were traveling to the village of Hira when one of us decided to go their own way. If we've disturbed you, please accept our apologies, he shouts at the creature. The spirit pauses for a moment, before lunging at Aang, trying to attack him. Your respectful tactic doesn't seem to be working, Zuko points out. The friends gather, Sokka throws his boomerang, while Katara launches ice knives, and Zuko launches a fireball. But the attacks have no effect, and the wolf just eats the fire. Did that wolf spirit just eat my fire? Zuko asks, stunned. And burped, Sokka yells in fear. It ate your fire and burped. Aang tries to reason with the spirit again, but the creature lunges once more. But this time, Appa intervenes, slamming into the wolf as Aang tries to tell him to go easy on it. The two creatures trade blows, with Appa finally slamming the wolf away with his tail. Woohoo! Sokka yells, Sky Bison one. Fire-eating wolf zero, Sokka cheers. The wolf struggles to its feet, strange noises coming from his mouth and stomach. Appa, I asked you to go easy on him. Are you okay, big giant wolf spirit? Aang yells. But the creature suddenly leans forward, vomiting up a swarm of moth wasps that fly towards the group. You are the grossest spirit ever, Sokka yells as the cloud of bugs swarm them. 
As the moth wasps attack, Azula rolls over, yelling at her brother. Free me, Zuzu! I'll take care of those spirits for you, she shouts. But Zuko looks at her, telling her that they don't need her help. Oh, right, because you and your friends have everything under control, she huffs, looking over at everyone being attacked. Finally, Zuko makes up his mind and blasts the ice wrap with a fireball. Azula gets to her feet, electricity crackling in her hands. She creates a ball of light, gathering the moth wasps to her. Throwing the ball of light away, the spirits follow after. Seeing them leave, the wolf quickly follows after them. You're welcome, Azula says, turning back to the group with a smile. That night, the group is resting peacefully, while Sokka and Zuko sit around the campfire, Azula muttering in her sleep, still arguing with her mother. After everything that's happened, you're still going to let her sleep with her hands unbound? Sokka asks. She saved us from the moths, didn't she? I'm giving her a chance, Zuko tells him. But Sokka doesn't agree, thinking they are giving her too many chances. Why are you still up? Zuko finally asks. Sokka smiles sheepishly. I drank a ton of water trying to get the taste of moth wasps out of my mouth. Now my bladders, he tells him. But Zuko holds up his hand, cutting him off. I got the picture, thanks, he tells his friend. Sokka glances over his shoulder, seeing his sister curled up from the cold. He stands and walks over to her, draping his blanket over her sleeping form, bringing a slumbering smile to her face. After all those snowballs you took to the head, you still look out for her? Zuko comments. I throw witticisms at her, she throws snowballs at me. The relationship works, Sokka answers with a shrug and a smile. Seems like you're getting the short end of the deal, Zuko notes. But Sokka shakes his head, telling him that when it comes to his sister, it doesn't matter if he gets the short end. And Zuko glances back at his own shivering sister, asking if Sokka has another blanket for him. Zuko walks across the clearing, draping the blanket over Azula's sleeping form. He begins to stand, but notices a letter tucked in his sister's boot. He pulls it free, reading his mother's words. My dearest Ikem, it's taken me a long time to admit it, but you were right. I belong with you, and nothing is worth this pain. My one consolation is our son, Zuko. When I look into his eyes, it's as if I'm looking into yours. My thoughts are with you always. Love, Ursa. Zuko's eyes read over the words again, shock displayed on his face. Our son. Beneath a tree, Azula lies sleeping. A hand reaches down, gently stroking her hair, and she snaps awake, startled to find her mother leaning over her. How did you get the jump on me? She demands in anger. Concern fills Ursa's eyes as she looks down at her daughter. Give up this futile quest, my daughter. Go home. The throne is Zuko's destiny. Yours lies elsewhere, she tells her. Azula struggles to her feet, smiling wickedly at her mother, promising her a swift doom when they reach her. But Ursa still looks at her sadly, asking her daughter to remove her mask of fear and intimidation and embrace her destiny. No! Why must you fill my mind with such lies? The throne is my destiny! Azula shouts angrily, about to blast her mother with electricity. But confusion suddenly fills her face, and the attack wavers. I isn't it? I have proof, she gasps. She reaches out for her mother, but her angry hand wraps around Katara's wrist instead. Sokka lashes out with his boomerang, trying to protect his sister, but Azula easily blocks it. The attack seems to take her out of her stupor, though, and she stares around, confused. She reaches down to her boot, discovering that her letter is missing. She turns on the others, angry once again. Where is Zuko? She demands. A short distance away, Zuko and Aang sit on a cliff, with Aang reading the letter that Zuko found. I can't believe it, he whispers. 
Zuko nods, telling Aang that the truth makes so much sense. Why Ozai could treat him so poorly. I'm not his son. But Aang isn't convinced. Not sure why Ozai wouldn't just get rid of Zuko permanently. I don't know about all this, Zuko. It can't be true, or at least it shouldn't be, Aang tells his friend. But Zuko doesn't agree, believing that this provides his future with hope. But if you're not Ozai's son, what does that mean for your reign? Who is the rightful Fire Lord? Aang asks. There you are! Azula shouts from behind them, the usual deranged look in her eye as energy begins to crackle in her hands. She told you to take that letter out of my boot, didn't she? She demands. She drops into a combat stance, launching an attack at her brother. Give it back! I'm not letting her win! She shouts. In the distant past, Ursa walks with her son and daughter through the palace gardens. Azula suddenly turns and burning one of the flowers, and Zuko yells for his mother, who comes over and puts out the fire quickly. You will treat the royal gardens with respect, Ursa tells her daughter, but Azula seems less than sorry. What? It deserved it. It wasn't as pretty as the others, she whispers. She reaches out, snapping fire at Zuko's behind. Tattletale, she hisses. Anger fills Ursa's voice as she orders her daughter to go to her room. Ursa reaches down, trying to console a saddened Zuko as Ozai watches on. He turns away from them, moving through the palace until he reaches his meeting with Vashir of the Yuyan archers. Ozai has a mission for this exceptional archer. In a small village called Hira, on the far edge of the Fire Nation, there lives a man named Ikem. Find him and rid the world of him, Ozai orders. Vashir nods, bowing to the Fire Lord and promising that it will be done. Back in the present, both Zuko and Aang do their best to ward off Azula's attacks. Zuko tells his friend to go find Sokka and Katara. I can handle Azula, he tells him. Give it back! Give it back! Azula keeps screaming, launching another attack. Zuko dodges, lashing fire at her with a leg sweep, but she leaps on him, snatching the letter from his belt. You tell her this is my destiny, she hisses, before jumping away. But Zuko is fast, snatching her foot and slamming her against the ground. Anger fills his voice as he lifts her into the air. From the day you were born, you've put me through so much. Why, Azula? Why'd our relationship have to be like this? He shouts at her. Holding her just by her tunic, Zuko dangles Azula over the cliff face. Was this her plan all along? Is she whispering in your ear right now to throw me over the cliff? She asks in her deranged voice. Zuko is stunned, telling his sister that she isn't making any sense. Don't deny it, Zuko. She told you I had the letter in my boot. She told you to wait until I was asleep to, Azula begins. But suddenly, she seems to calm down. Wait a minute. You've had that letter all night. Why didn't you burn it when you had the chance? She asks. Zuko glares at her, finally putting her down. And Azula stares back at him, shocked that he wants to keep the letter. Zuko turns away from her telling her that they need to finish what they've started. Oh, Zuzu, are you actually on my side? She asks. But Zuko just walks away, telling her to rejoin the group. At the campsite, the others are finishing putting out the fires that Azula started. As Zuko and Azula enter the clearing, the others glare at her. Nature hates you, Sokka huffs at her. Aang looks over at Azula before turning back to Zuko. So, uh, you guys aren't fighting anymore? He asks. Zuko shakes his head. We've arrived at an understanding, he tells his friends. The group begins to climb aboard Appa, while Sokka points out that this is what Zuko has said since they left the palace. And since then, she's tried to kill us like 12 times, Sokka shouts. With everyone aboard, Appa leaps into the air, heading towards the end of their journey. In the past, Prince Ozai and his family sit around the dinner table while Azula talks about how Master Kunio was correcting her form. I told him that's how you get the biggest fire blast, 
He didn't care. He wanted me to do the form his way, the dumb way. So when he had his back turned, I set his pants on fire. She cries happily. Ozai nods in approval. Your teacher sounds like a fool. I will send him to the colonies, he tells her. But Zuko speaks up, explaining how Kunio believes that proper firebending starts with proper form. But his words are interrupted as Ozai slams his fist down on the table, startling the family. He glares at his son. Zuko, how dare you lecture your sister on firebending? Despite being a year younger, how many more forms has she mastered than you? He demands. Zuko hangs his head. Fourteen, he whispers sadly. Anger sparks in Ozai's eyes as he stares at his son, explaining that when Zuko was born, they weren't even sure if he was a firebender. I plan to cast you from the palace. How embarrassing for a prince of the Fire Nation to have a non-bender as his firstborn, he shouts. Azula was born lucky. You were lucky to be born. Ursa stands, beginning to shout at her husband. But the anger is interrupted by a guard informing Ozai that a Yuyan archer requests a meeting with him. Without a word, Ozai leaves his family behind, traveling up to one of the towers in the palace. Bashir kneels before the Fire Prince, his uniform tattered and dirty. He explains that the man known as Aikam moved to a forest near Hira and was never seen again. Bashir journeyed into the forest, hoping to find the man, but was unable to. That forest, your highness, I've never seen anything like it. The trees, the animals, the insects, they're all out to get you. No commoner could have survived for long, Vashir explains. He bows once more to Ozai, telling the prince that he believes his desires were already fulfilled. But Ozai is not convinced. This is all mere conjecture. You bring me no assurance of his demise, he hisses. The archer apologizes, but Ozai's mood shifts, and he helps the man to his feet. He orders him to return to his elite unit and give his resignation. Bashir is shocked, questioning the prince. The Yuyan archers are an elite fighting force, the best of the best. You no longer belong, Ozai tells him, turning and leaving the man behind. Ozai travels down to his wife's chambers, ordering her handmaidens to leave immediately. He snatches at Ursa's hand, reminding her about how he ordered her to forget her old life, that having any contact with her past is considered treason. I knew it! I knew you were intercepting my letters! How dare you! She yells at him. He tells her he knows of her treachery, that he knows of Zuko. But I am a merciful man. I will allow the child to live, despite the lowliness of his true heritage. Ikem, however, deserved his punishment, he tells her. What did you do? She asks, distraught. I wiped that treacherous dog from existence, he tells her with an evil grin. Back in the present, Appa lands, allowing the group to disembark outside of Hira. Quickly, they disguise themselves as regular citizens of the Fire Nation and enter the town. Walking through, they discover a large crowd gathering in the square. I thought Hira was supposed to be a small town. Why is it so crowded? Katara asks. The group walks forward, discovering that the crowd is gathered around a stage, watching a play. I recognize this scene. It's the final battle from Love Amongst Dragons, Zuko tells them. The two actors portraying the dragons have a mock battle, throwing confetti as they're bending. As the group watches on, Zuko turns to his sister, reminding her of the times their mother used to take them to watch the play when they were younger. The play ends with the two dragons professing their love for one another, bringing cheers and clapping from the crowd. With the play over, the crowd begins to disperse and Zuko steps up to an elderly couple, asking for information about a woman named Ursa. Ursa? Wasn't she the magistrate's daughter? The old man asks. His wife nods her head, beginning to bring up rumors of why she left. But the group is interrupted by a man wearing the blue spirit mask. Excuse me, my name's Norin. I'm the director of the Hira acting troupe. Ursa was once a member. The man introduces himself, shaking Zuko's hand. 
He offers them to his home so that they can talk about Ursa away from the crowds. We'll share some tea and I'll tell you everything I know, Norin tells them. Zuko bows, thanking the man for the honor. The day turns to evening as the group shares tea at Norin's home, introducing themselves to his wife of five years. Meanwhile, Azula and Zuko meet Kiyi, the couple's young daughter. Yet Azula is her standard evil self while Zuko befriends the young girl. Kiyi, are you being hospitable to our guests? Norin asks as he comes in with Sokka, bringing a tray of tea. I'm trying, Kiyi tells her father, glancing at Azula. The group sits down, with Norin explaining he would love to share stories with those who claim to be drama historians. Katara glances at her brother, and he smiles. Great cover story, right? I just opened my mouth and there it was, he whispered to her. Norin explains to them that Ursa is one of the acting troupe's most famous members. Years ago, she was taken away to the capital. Supposedly, she married into the royal family. This all happened before I came to town, but even I've heard the rumors, Norin's wife, Noriko, explains. What about Icom? Zuko asks. Norin pauses for a moment, shocked that Zuko had ever heard of the man. Icom was an actor too. Ursa's boyfriend, I believe. He disappeared shortly after Ursa left, Norin explains. Folks say he ran off into the forgetful valley, a forest at the bottom of the canyon, just outside of town. The heartbroken go there to forget their lives, Noriko adds. The woman looks up at the ceiling, thinking on the issue. You know, I vaguely remember hearing that Ursa came back to town years later looking for Ikem. They say she went after him in the forgetful valley, she tells them. But Norin shakes his head. That can't be true. No one's seen or heard from Ursa since she was taken to the capital, Norin tells his wife. Well, if it is true, it's awfully romantic, Noriko says. But Norin continues to shake his head. Romantic or tragic? Forgetful Valley is a dark, dangerous place. No one who enters ever returns, he tells his wife. After the tea, the group steps back out into the night air, bowing to their gracious hosts. They move through the village, heading back towards Appa. Ugh, more than once tonight, I was tempted to burn that whole place down. But I resisted for you, Zuzu. I hope you appreciate that, Azula tells her brother. How could you even think about that with such a loving family? Katara asks. But Azula waves her hand dismissively. Oh please, their charade disgusted me. Nobody's that happy, she snaps. Catching up to his friend in the dark, Aang apologizes for what he said that morning to Zuko. Yet he believes that Aikum should stay lost to history, and they should burn the letter. I don't have the letter anymore. Azula took it back. Zuko tells Aang. He tells him that they need to find his mother first, then they can figure out who he is supposed to be. But Aang reaches out, putting his hand on Zuko's shoulder. Listen to me. When people come to your throne room and bow, they're not bowing to you, they're bowing to what you represent. A new era of love and peace. So it doesn't matter who your real dad is, you have to stay Fire Lord. You're not the Fire Lord for you. You're the Fire Lord for all of us, Aang explains. Sokka steps forward, indicating to the two girls fighting behind him, and asks how long they plan to continue to travel. I give it another two minutes before something is on fire or encased in ice, Sokka explains. But Zuko nods, a look of determination on his face. One more place to visit and we're done. We're going to Forgetful Valley, he explains. In the past, Azula sits on the edge of Zuko's bed, apparently happy by what she just told him. Stop it! You're lying! Dad would never do that to me! Zuko shouts, distressed. Ursa enters the room because of the commotion. Your father would never do what to you? What is going on here? She asks her children. Azula looks up at her mother, innocence on her face. I don't know, she tells as Ursa takes her arm and leads her out of the room telling her daughter that they need to talk. In the hallway, Azula admits that she overheard their grandfather and father speaking in the throne room. She heard her father ask for Uncle Iroh's birthright, and their grandfather got very mad. 
Now for punishment, Daddy has to get rid of Zuko. Grandfather wants him to know the pain of losing a firstborn, she tells her mother. Ursa turns away from her daughter, ordering her to go to bed. Moving through the halls, Ursa doesn't see the evil smile that spreads across her young daughter's lips. Ozai, you can't do this! Ursa cries as she enters her husband's chambers. He turns away from the window, regarding her. I have no choice. Refusing the Fire Lord's command is treason. But I am a merciful man. I'm waiting till he's asleep. He won't feel a thing, Ozai tells her. Ursa looks at the prince for a moment before making up her mind. Listen carefully. I'll make you a deal. I know how to make a poison that is odorless and colorless, completely untraceable. It causes a person to pass quietly, as if he's simply fallen asleep. I'll give you a vial in exchange for Zuko's life. Once the poison is in your hands, you do whatever you wish, she tells her husband. Ozai turns away from her, staring out the window. I accept your plan on one condition. Once we've made the exchange, you must leave the city and never show your face again. With you around, it is only a matter of time before a colorless, odorless poison is used against the new Fire Lord, he tells her. Ursa agrees, but demands to take her children with her. But Ozai shakes his head, telling her that if she keeps her word, no harm will come to them. But should you try to stay or take your children, I will hunt you down like I did your boyfriend, he warns. That very night, Ursa creates the poison as her mother showed her years ago. She hands it to Ozai and without a word, leaves him in the night. She stops in Azula's room, kissing her daughter gently on the cheek. And then when she goes to see Zuko and leans down to kiss him on the cheek, the young boy awakens, calling for her. She pulls him close, hugging her son. Zuko, my love, listen to me. Everything I've done, I've done to protect you, she whispers. Remember this, Zuko. No matter how things seem to change, never forget who you are, she tells him. In the present, the group bid farewell to Appa, walking the last few feet into the forgetful valley. The sun seems to disappear as the trees crowd the sky overhead casting the earth into a gloomy twilight. Sokka stops, staring up at the strange face that looks at them from within a large boulder, seemingly warning and inviting at the same time. So this must be Forgetful Valley, Aang notes, stepping up next to his friend. How do you know? Are you detecting something with your special avatar powers? Sokka asks. But Aang shakes his head, pointing to the sign next to him. No, it, it says so on the sign. They continue forward, but there doesn't seem to be a path, and they aren't sure where to go exactly. Come on, Zuzu! For a true firebender, there's always a path! Azula shouts, blasting a hole through the forest, setting many plants on fire. Nature hates you! Sokka shouts as the others work to put out the flames. Suddenly, Aang turns away, clutching at his face. Quiet, guys! I'm sensing something with my special avatar powers! It's kind of making me want to go like this, he tells them, turning to show the weird face he is making. Sweetie, not with the faces again, Katara says, looking at her boyfriend. But Sokka waves his hand, telling his sister that he thinks Aang is onto something. He reaches out, showing them that there are strange faces on plants and animals all around them. He points out that the face Aang is making is the same pattern on that giant flutter bat that is flying away. Aang agrees and starts to chase after the critter. Don't fly away, Mr. Flutterbat! I think we're meant to be friends! Aang yells as Zuko tries to call for him not to run off. But Aang doesn't listen, chasing the Flutterbat through the woods until it leads him to an incredibly still pool of water. Whoa! Aang whispers, looking at the mirror-like water. The others catch up to him, also shocked by the stillness of the pool. I've never seen water so clear and still. Katara tells them. It's like a perfect pane of glass, Zuko agrees. Aang nods, looking at the others, telling them to be respectful. This is a spiritual place, he tells them. Azula looks down at the still waters, once again seeing her mother's reflection in it. You're going the wrong way, Azula. Turn back and find your true destiny. 
Ursa whispers to her daughter. But anger fills Azula again as she screams for her mother to shut up, blasting the water with electricity. Aang begins to yell at her, but Azula launches another attack at him as well. She told you to leave me here, didn't she? So she could keep tormenting me with her lies. She screams. As Zuko yells for Azula to stop, Katara agrees, pulling the water from the pool to launch an attack. We've tried to put up with her, but she's too dangerous, Katara tells her friend. Suddenly, twin flowery throwing stars sail out of the woods, cutting across Katara and Azula's arms and embedding themselves into the tree behind Aang. These are the prettiest throwing stars I've ever seen, Aang exclaims, admiring the weapons. More of the stars launch out and everyone defends themselves. Katara sees one shatter on Sokka's club, finally understanding, realizing that someone is bending the water in the flowers to make them more rigid. But suddenly the vines from above attack them as well, and Sokka manages to save Aang from being attacked and then is shocked when Azula saves him. The more peasants I have fighting for me, the better chance I have of surviving this nightmare forest, she explains. The vines keep attacking, and finally Katara begins to bend the water in them as well, twisting them away so that they are harmless. Whoever you are, you're not the only one who can water bend. Show yourself, she orders. Everyone is shocked when two members of the water tribe step out of the woods and into the clearing. In the past, Ursa walks through Hira village in the dark. She returns to her old home, knocking on the front door to be greeted by a young girl. Forgive me for disturbing you. I am looking for Magistrate Jinzuk and his wife, Rina, she explains, lowering her hood. But the little girl lets her know that they both passed away. Later, Ursa finds herself at the theater stage, alone and sad. If you're looking for a role in this year's production, I have bad news for you. Tryouts ended weeks ago, a voice calls to her. But she stands, tears in her eyes, letting the man know that she was just visiting some old memories. Norin introduces himself to Ursa, telling her that he took over the acting troupe some years ago. He holds out his hand, telling her that sitting alone on a stage is no way to start the day, and offers her breakfast. That's very kind of you, thank you, Ursa smiles at him. In the present, the group sits around a fire, sharing their meal with the water tribesmen. The elderly woman, Misu, apologizes. My brother and I just aren't used to seeing other humans around here. When we heard the commotion, we thought a forest animal was disturbing the pool. It must remain undisturbed, she tells them. Aang agrees, and the woman informs him that there are three other pools like it throughout the forest. So how did two people from the Northern Water Tribe end up in the Fire Nation? Katara asks. Misu looks at her, explaining that growing up, her brother liked to break the rules. He used to steal things from other members of the tribe, but he would always return them, and the people he would steal from would be so embarrassed that he would never get into any trouble. But one day, his luck ran out. I found him alone on the ice, his face horribly disfigured. It changed his life, our lives, forever, she tells them. Misu made it her life's mission to save her brother and learned of an ancient spirit that lived in these woods that had the power to give people new faces. And the two tried desperately to get here. After many failed attempts, we finally made it to Forgetful Valley, and we've lived here ever since hoping to encounter the spirit, Misu tells them. So you've spent your whole life trying to heal your brother? Aang asks, and Misu nods. Of course, I'm his sister, she says simply. Katara and Sokka smile at each other, but Azula and Zuko merely turn away. Azula rudely interrupts the story, demanding to know if the siblings had seen their mother, but Misu shakes her head, telling them that they haven't seen anyone in quite some time. Aang interrupts, asking what the Great Spirit looks like, but Misu doesn't know, just that the forest tells them when she is arriving. Face-like patterns begin to manifest on the trees, the wings of the insects, and the backs of the animals. Then, on a night like tonight, a giant wolf bearing the mark of a face travels from far away to drink from one of the forest's four pools. 
Whichever pool he drinks from, there the spirit appears. But we never seem to be in the right pool, Misu explains to them. She sighs, looking at her brother and telling him that they once again missed the great spirit. But Aang disagrees, believing that there is something that he can do, and goes to sit by the side of the pool. I'm going to try and cross over into the spirit world and try to get that giant wolf spirit to come here, he tells them. But Azula becomes angry, stomping off into the woods as Zuko follows her. Did we travel all this way to help a couple dirty vagrants or to find our mother? She demands. But Zuko explains that Aang is the avatar and he helps people and they're friends, so they help him. Suddenly, a deranged look appears on Azula's face once more. Wait, did she arrange all this? She asks, beginning to shout up into the lonely trees. I'm getting close, aren't I, mother? Is that why you sent those two vagrants to slow me down? She demands no one. She rushes back into the clearing, preparing to attack Misu and Rafa, shouting to her mother that her plan isn't going to work. Zuko jumps in front of the attack, redirecting the lightning and shouting for his sister to stop. Meanwhile, Aang has entered the spirit realm, looking up to see the Flutterbat hanging over his head. Mr. Flutterbat, I knew we were meant to be friends, he shouts joyfully, and the spirit spreads its wings. Come with me, I will show you what you want to see, it tells him. Aang rides on the great spirit's back, high above the treetops of Forgetful Valley. He looks down, seeing the four pools far below and the great wolf running along. Aang leaps down, trying to convince the wolf spirit that he is a friend, but the spirit doesn't look at him, bending down to take a drink from one of the pools. Hey, don't drink from here. There's a pool over there that tastes way better, Aang tells the spirit, but the wolf regards him coldly, turning away it moves to gallop off into the forest again, and Aang leaps onto its back. He holds on as the wolf moves at great speed. Finally, Aang opens his eyes to find that they've arrived at another pool. Who dares ride my wolf as if she were some common beast of burden? A voice calls to him. Aang looks up at the brightness above him. My name is Aang. I'm the Avatar. Who are you? He asks. The great spirit stands over him, faces floating all around her. I am the mother of faces. Lightning cracks from Azula's fingertips towards Zuko as he tries to defend Misu and Rafa. The lightning hits Zuko, but he redirects it into the sky. Zuko looks at his sister, yelling at her for her attack. Misu and Rafa have nothing to do with our mother, he shouts at her. But Azula has that deranged look in her eyes again. But that's exactly what she wants you to believe, Zuzu. How could you be so naive, she cries. Zuko looks at his sister and sadness begins to appear in his eyes. You're right, I have been naive, he tells her before turning to his friends. Take her down. Katara and Sokka launch into their attacks while Misu begs for them all to stop. No, don't do this. The Avatar is trying to bring the Great Spirit here, she begs. She's right. Stop, Aang tells them, suddenly returning from the Avatar's state in the spirit world. Sokka breathes a sigh of relief. Oh, it's just you, Aang. This forest is so creepy I half expected another creepy face, Sokka tells his friends. Aang smiles, pointing towards the pool of water as several creepy masks bob to the surface. Aang smiles, looking at his friends and telling them that they need to stop fighting. We're about to have a visitor. The water begins to bubble gently, building in intensity. Suddenly, with a geyser of water, the mother of faces rises up. In the past, Ursa sits across from Norin at a noodle shop. She points out that his name is a strange coincidence seeing how it's the name of one of the characters in the upcoming play. Well, you may have a point there, Ursa, Norin tells her with a smile. Ursa is shocked, as she never introduced herself. She stands, not trusting Norin, and begins to leave, but the man begs her to stop, promising to explain. When we were six, you kicked me in the stomach and pushed my face in the dirt. When we were 21, you shattered my heart. 
he tells her. Ursa stops, turning back to the man, stunned and confused. It can't be, she whispers. And now you're going to walk away before we even get the chance for a proper conversation? My dear Ursa, don't you think you've hurt me enough? Norin asks. Ursa smiles, tears in her eyes. Ikem, she breathes. The Great Spirit stares down at the group that has gathered around one of her sacred pools. I am the Mother of Faces. Through me, separateness came into the world. Through me came identity. The one became many. I walk through my forest once a season, but never have I strayed from the path my wolf chooses for me. I do so now in deference to the Avatar. Each season, I grant one favor to one human. You may make your request now, she tells them. Aang is confused. He turns back to both Zuko and Misu, who both have requests. Just one? He asks. Aang turns back to the Mother of Faces, explaining that they actually have two requests this season. Do not test my generosity, young Avatar. One, she tells him. Zuko nods, turning to look at Misu and Rafa. They've waited for so long. If there's only one, it should be theirs, he tells Aang. He motions for Misu to step forward, but Azula isn't allowing it. She pushes Zuko and Misu aside, striding up to the Mother of Faces. We seek a princess of the Fire Nation named Ursa. Tell me where to find her, she demands of the spirit. The Mother of Faces holds out her hand, displaying a shimmering image of Ursa. Ursa, I remember her. I could not understand why a human of such beauty would ask for a new face, the spirit tells her. She explains that she offered her a plain face, and the image shifts to a face they recognize. That's Noriko, Zuko shouts, recognizing Norin's wife. Zuko turns back to where his sister stood. But she is gone. He begins to head through the forest, but Misu shouts for him, telling him that she knows a shortcut. Thank you, he tells her. You were kind to us, she nods, despite what happened. Zuko begins to run, but Sokka quickly catches up to him. I know sisters can be a pain to deal with, and mine's not even that crazy. You're gonna need backup, Sokka tells his friend. Thanks, Zuko smiles. In the clearing, Aang turns to Katara, pointing towards where their friends ran and telling her that they need to help. But Katara is still watching Misu, who is trying to slow the Mother of Faces with her waterbending. Don't leave us yet, I beg you! Misu shouts, explaining that they've searched years for her. Foolish human, you dare bend the water of my sacred pool, the Mother of Faces shouts. Aang steps forward, trying to explain that Misu didn't mean any disrespect. But the spirit disappears beneath the surface, bidding them farewell. No, wait! Aang shouts, diving into the waters after her. In the past, Norin escorts Ursa to the old prop warehouse. There, he explains that once she left, the people of the village looked at him like he was something broken. So he did what people do when they want to forget their misery. He went into Forgetful Valley. He tells her that he found the great spirit there and asked for a new life, a new face. I came back to Hira as a different person, he tells her. Ursa steps forward, putting her hand on his cheek and asking why he never married, never had any children. You know why, he tells her simply, sadly. He puts his hand on her shoulders, telling her that a new face will keep her safe from the Fire Nation. But she looks at him. There is so much of my life in the royal palace that I want to leave behind. But I am a mother now. I can't leave my children behind. But if I got a new face, maybe I could return to the capital city undetected. Maybe I could at least see my children again, make sure they're okay, she says, suddenly excited. Ikum looks at her, asking what she would do then. Would you stay in the city, hoping to catch a glimpse of them from time to time? Watch them grow from afar? What kind of life is that? He asks. Finally, she takes his hand, telling him to take her to the forgetful valley so she can meet this spirit. Aang dives deep into the pool as he creates an air bubble so that he can breathe, following the images of faces as he tries to explain to the mother of faces why she needs to help Misu and Rafa. 
but the creatures of the pool begin to attack Aang, trying to get rid of the intruder. Mother of faces, how can you be so cruel? He shouts into the depths. There is a rumbling beneath him, and suddenly an underwater geyser shoots out. The force of the water shoots him back out of the pool, and luckily, Katara manages to catch him with her waterbending. Suddenly, the pool erupts once more, and the Mother of Faces stands before them again. Since the beginning of time, I've fashioned faces with great care and deliberation, with all of my heart. In each face, I put a piece of my own being. But these humans trample into my forest to make demands of me as if I were their servant. They dare ask me to replace my precious gifts with new ones? Do you know how it feels to be told by insignificant beings that your work is inadequate? She demands of them. She leans down, telling the Avatar once a season is all the kindness she can tolerate. You, Avatar, are supposed to be the best of the humans. Yet you jump into my sacred pool and defile it with your presence. You scold me like a child. Avatar or not, you humans are the same. Selfish, short-sighted, insolent. Get out of my forest and take your friends with you she demands, and the clearing grows dark around them as angry faces appear on the plants and animals. Ikem and Ursa went into the woods, traveling together. They made a shelter, learning to live off the land as they waited for the Great Spirit. Time passed, and they grew close once again. Then one day, they hear the Great Wolf drinking from the nearby pool. Ikem tells her that the Great Spirit is nearby, and that soon she will be able to see her children again. But Ursa only becomes sad. These last few months, living with you in the forest, I feel like I've finally found my place in the world, she tells him. Ikem nods, thinking that maybe they can bring her children to live with them in Hira. But she shakes her head. You don't know what Ozai is like. I wouldn't just be endangering my children and myself. I'd be endangering you and probably the whole town, she tells him. Ikem nods, turning to the pool as it begins to bubble, and the Mother of Faces appears, looking down at the bowing Ursa. Human, what do you ask of me? She questions. Ursa keeps her head bowed, requesting that the spirit give her a new face. The Mother of Faces holds out her hand, not understanding why Ursa would want to give up such a beautiful face. Would you be willing to accept one much plainer than your own? She asks, showing the image of Ursa's future face. Any face will do, as long as it's new, Ursa tells her. The Mother of Faces leans back, regarding the small human. Ursa, I sense much pain in you. Do you really believe that a new face will relieve you of this pain? She asks. But Ursa knows that it won't, that her pain comes from a life she didn't choose for herself. I can do more than give you just a new face. I can give you a new mind, one that doesn't remember the life that came before. The Mother of Faces offers. Ursa turns back to look at Ikem, asking if she'll remember him. Is he a part of the life you wish to forget? The Mother of Faces asks. No, then you will remember him. Will I remember my children? Ursa asks, looking at the ground. Are they a part of the life that you wish to forget? The Mother asks once more. Yes, then you will not remember them. Tears begin to well in Ursa's eyes, and the Mother tells her that she must decide. Do you wish to have both a new face and a new mind? The Mother asks once more. Yes, Ursa tells her. The Mother of Faces tells her to hold on as she reaches down and places the new face onto Ursa. The spirit wraps her hands around Ursa's face. Glowing light begins to flow through her fingertips. Ikem rushes forward, and as the light fades, the Mother of Faces pulls away and vanishes beneath the waters of the pool. Norin, where are you? Noriko yells, her eyes not quite focusing. Norin pulls her in close. I'm right here. I'll always be right here, he tells her. It wasn't long after that the village gathered for their wedding. 
Zuko and Sokka reach the village, quickly moving through the night until they are outside Norin and Noriko's house. It's so quiet, Sokka points out, readying his boomerang. Zuko steps up, peering into the window to find the family eating dinner together. Good thing Misu's shortcut worked, he whispered as they thought Azula had done something awful. Zuko rounds the corner, telling Sokka that he's going to go inside and asks his friend to watch out for Azula. After a gentle knock, Norin answers the door. I had a feeling you'd return, Norin tells him. Kii runs towards Zuko, calling him her best friend and hugging him. She drags him inside and the family invites the young man to eat dinner with them. The family laughs and enjoys each other's company, but Zuko can't help staring at the woman that he now knows to be his mother. Norin turns to the young man, asking him why he hasn't touched his food. Do you do this every night? Zuko asks. Noriko nods, explaining that they always eat dinner together. She looks at him, asking why he came back to the village. Zuko looks at the woman, silent for a moment before he finally asks her. Tell me, Noriko, are you happy? He asks. She smiles at him, motioning to her family. Of course, I'm where I belong, she tells him. Zuko smiles at his mother's words and begins to stand. I've bothered you folks enough. Have a good evening, he tells them. But Norn tells him to stop turning back to Noriko and telling her that he knew this day would come eventually. Go ahead, young man. Do what you came here to do. Tell her you haven't forgotten who you are, Norin tells Zuko. Zuko turns back. My name is Zuko. I am the Lord of the Fire Nation, and I am your son. In the forest clearing, the spirit animals are surrounding Katara, Aang, Misu, and Rafa. Aang warns them not to harm the spirits as they begin to close in. The spirits keep shouting for them to get out, and Aang orders everyone to leave, but Misu refuses. My brother and I aren't leaving this forest until we have what we came for, she shouts, looking at her brother once more. One of the spirits leaps at Misu, and Aang uses an air blast to knock it away. The gust of wind stirs Rafa's mask, knocking it from his head to reveal the smooth area where his face should be. Misu yells that Rafa needs his mask, but Aang stops her, telling them that he's seen this before, when I met Ko the Face Stealer. Quiet, the mother of faces orders the spirits as she holds up her hands. Repeat what you said, Avatar. Aang stands there, telling the mother of faces of Ko the Face Stealer and the time that they met. He is my son, she explains. She tells them that Ko has been estranged from her and that legends say he misses her so much that he spent all of history stealing faces. The mother reaches out, her hand engulfing Rafa's face. She can sense her son's handiwork and her hand begins to glow. Finally, she pulls away and Misu rushes to her brother. Rafa looks up at her, his face returned. Hey sis, he smiles. Katara and Aang smile at the two siblings as they hug. Aang turns back to the Mother of Faces, thanking her for what she did, restoring the relationship between a brother and sister and a mother and son. Standing before his mother, Zuko looks at her. Norin bows, telling Zuko that he had already recognized him as he had learned all he could about Ursa's children. He apologizes for lying to them, hoping that he could give them enough information to satisfy them while also protecting his family. He turns to Noriko, who still seems confused. You were once a princess of the Fire Nation. You had two children. One of them grew to become the Fire Lord. You don't remember any of this because a powerful spirit altered your memories, Norin explains. He turns back to Zuko, explaining that he also used to go by the name Icom. Then, maybe this is where I belong too, Zuko says, sitting back down at the table. With my mother, my sister, and my father, he says, looking at Icom. The man is shocked, explaining to Zuko that that's not possible. Suddenly, there is a loud crash outside, and sounds of fighting reach them as the rooftop explodes inwards. Azula lands, immediately spinning and kicking Zuko in the chest. She stands on the table, looking down at her mother. You! Finally! I can't tell you how long I've waited for this moment! She snarls at Noriko. 
Kiyi cowers with her father as Azula glares at them both. Tell me, mother, did you have a new daughter because your last one turned out to be such a monster? She asks. Sokka steps forward, telling her to stay back. Ha! Back for more, snow peasant? Where's your little toy? She asks, energy burning around her. Right there, Sokka points out, just as the boomerang cracks her in the back of the head. Sokka yells for everyone to scatter, making sure that Norin and Kiyi are safe. Azula struggles to her feet, leaping after the fleeing Noriko, who she pins to the wall. It all ends now, Azula hisses. Noriko reaches out her hand, touching Azula's cheek. If what you say is true, if I really am your mother, then I'm sorry I didn't love you enough, she whispers. Azula is stunned, tears in her eyes as she pauses. Zuko steps in, pushing his sister away. She lashes out at him, but he dodges her electric attack and sweeps a flaming kick at her. Azula leaps in, lashing out with punches and kicks, but Zuko dodges them, letting her strikes hit the wall. Oh, for crying out loud, stop moving, she snaps as she attacks again, sending a lightning strike at him. But Zuko redirects it, sending it back at her and slamming her into the wall. On the ground, she tries to plead with her brother. Don't you get it, Suzu? We'll finally be free. You of the throne and me of this incessant nagging in my head, she shouts at him. Zuko tells her that she is wrong, but Azula holds up the letter. She knows that he doesn't want the throne anymore, but Zuko is quiet, pulling free his crown. In my heart, I've always known that the throne is my destiny, he tells her. He looks at Azula, telling her that no matter how messed up their relationship is, she will always be his sister. Shut up, she bellows, launching another flurry of attacks. She rushes past him, running out into the night, and both Zuko and Noriko follow after her as Azula heads for the edge of the woods. But they can't catch up with her, and she disappears into the Forgotten Valley. Fire Lord, look, Noriko shouts, pointing as the Mother of Faces comes out of the valley with Appa close by. Human, do you wish to return to who you once were? Do you wish to remember? The mother asks, looking down at Noriko. Zuko tries to stop her, telling her that she has such a happy life, but Noriko nods her head. Yes, she whispers, and the spirit reaches out her hand. The next day, Zuko and Ursa stand in the yard of their home. He looks over at Norin and Kiyi, telling his mother that she should go to them. No, you and I need to talk, she tells him. Zuko, what I said to Azula, I owe you the same apology. I'm sorry I didn't love you enough, she tells him, apologizing for choosing to forget him. But Zuko smiles, telling her that everything turned out okay. I've got some good friends now and a life I can be proud of he tells her. She smiles at him, proud of the Fire Lord he has become. But Zuko reaches into his pocket, pulling out the letter that she had long ago written to Ikum. I know I'm the Fire Lord because it's my destiny. Even so, Mother, I need to know more about this, he tells her, handing the letter to her. Ursa nods, looking down at the words she had written, and she tells him that those words weren't true. It was long ago that Ozai told her what he did to Ikum for her treachery, and Ursa reaches out to slap the man, but he catches her hand. Ozai, you know as well as I do that Zuko is your son, she shouts. Ozai knows. He had his men following her for months before the wedding. He demands to know why she wrote the lie, and tears begin to fill Ursa's eyes. Maybe I wanted to see if you were reading my personal letters. Maybe I wanted to hurt you, even for a moment, she hisses at him. And she begins to cry, telling Ozai that maybe it was her wishful thinking, that Zuko would turn out nothing like Ozai. And the prince smiles at her. Then that's how I'll treat him, dear. I want you to watch carefully from now on. Every time I speak harshly to him, every time I wound him, Every time that I treat Zuko as if he were the son of a treacherous dog, I will simply be fulfilling his mother's wish. Zuko is shocked by this story, 
Ozai is a wretched man. To treat you like that just to get back at me? Especially when you were so young, she tells him. Zuko looks down at the letter. But he's still my father, he whispers. Yes, she nods. She looks down, telling him that there is so much that she wants to tell him about her life before Ozai and now. And he smiles at his mother. I want to know everything from the beginning, he tells her. She takes his arm, beginning to lead him through the village. For you, my dear, I'll start from the beginning. And that is the end of the Avatar The Last Airbender series, The Search. If you did enjoy this, we do have the playlist that includes all of the other Avatar The Last Airbender comics, as well as the Legend of Korra comics, which we are currently in the process of making. But don't worry, if you don't want to go through each of those individual Avatar stories, we will be making them into full stories again very soon. If you guys did enjoy this, please be sure to give the video a like, leave a comment down below, make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit that bell icon to get notifications. And if you want to support us even more, you can join us on patreon.com slash comicstorian. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you Patreons for supporting our channel. We really do appreciate it, and we will see you next time.